grab yourself a Sodi Pop because we're back in Johto with another Pokemon Crystal Solo run and this time I have a first for you guys. I'm going to use my first Gen 1 Pokemon in Gen 2 so let's see how this Cantonian Mommy does. The rules for the run are in the description and I went this direction for two main reasons. The first is really simple. Normal tops are top tier in Generation 2. I think they have the most potential and the second is to sort of see firsthand the effect of the special change from Gen 1 to Gen 2 and if it makes a difference. For the uninitiated special was a unified stat in Gen 1. It encompassed both attack and defense. It was really overpowered and Gen 2 split that stat making a pretty obvious balance change. With our little kangaroo we get these updated stats and my biggest critique and what held this Pokemon back the most in Gen 1 was its very pathetic 40 special stat. It's just it's so out of place and even here in Gen 2 that special attack sticks out like a sore thumb. 40 is awful. It's what you would find on like a, a wild weedle in the first wild grass begging for scraps. Now while Kangaskhan will likely never be using any special attacks in the run, the two times buff to its special defense and all the other stats look great. Seriously, like I get I get surprised every time I look at Kangaskhan's stats because they're so good. The learn set, <laughs> it's a learn set. I'll talk about it a little bit during the run, but there's a lot of normal things here. There's just very few things that are going to add much value to the run. The TM list is where the options kind of open up, or at least you would think. Now there's a lot of great things here, and most of the time you'd be salivating at the thought of getting coverage from the three elemental punches, serve, you get access to all three tutor moves in the post game I don't have them listed here but the important thing is that you guys see the full list and we'll, we'll save the deeper dive for later we'll be talking about that special attack a good bit now in the early game I do the bare minimum here rival to Maki to Faulkner's gym trainers and once again I just want to say that berries as a held item is underrated you can take these to the first gym you can take these down to Bugsy if you wanted to they just add a lot of stats the 10 HP is a lot of extra HP this early in the game now, I'm telling you guys they pretty much allow any half Halfway decent Pokemon to get past Faulkner earlier. You don't have to grind in the Sprout Tower. It's pretty useless for good runs. And just like Guard Spec by Silphco or Light Years Junior Trainer Blackout Grinding, you're going to see it catch on sooner rather than later. You heard it here first. The only thing I would like to touch on in the early game as all this footage is kind of playing out of the trainer battles I just mentioned is Comet Punch. And I really, I don't remember hating this move as much as I did during this run as when I like used it in the Gen 1 run. It really wasn't bad there. It's one of those typical 2-5 to five turn moves it has low power 85 percent accuracy and at least for me this run it felt really bad in this run it felt like there was about a 60 percent chance to maybe hit twice maybe it had like a 35 percent chance to miss and that remaining five percent is a crit that didn't matter so it didn't feel good this run now since i only show the optimized runs i really i don't have the best footage but some behind the scenes personal highlights for me with comet punch were things like it missing three times in a row on several occasions or missing at crucial moments that caused me to just to restart the entire run and I even lost to the coughing and the slow poke well I was poisoned I only got two hits a couple of times in a row and then I missed and had a slow and painful death I don't comment punch not very good I would not recommend it now let me just make this clear I don't think this move is bottom tier I don't think it's the worst move obviously moves like splash they're designed to be useless and a move like constrict is just laughably bad if you've never looked at constrict go look at it but moves like comment punch fury swaps double slap they feel awful when you're trying to push for like a solid run especially when you're like me and you have like a finite time to do it but rant over the last thing I'll say and no spoilers but if Kangaskhan started with like stomp or something powerful like that I think it would move this Pokemon up an entire tier in my book but enough of that let's just take a look at Faulkner Speaking of moves, you do learn Leer at level 7, and with the berry I can take a lot of punishment here, and in the final run I use Leer a lot until I could replace Comet Punch. Now let's say Comet Punch is a 3 hit knockout, maybe you're just hitting twice every time. With its accuracy I just found it infinitely more efficient and less rage inducing to do something like maybe Leer 2 times, put the Pokemon into a range where even like a low roll 2 hit could basically knock it out, and that's what I do here, it's how I just kept things consistent. Now there's not a ton of analysis here. But let me just say once again, the berry is great. And as much as I've complained about it up to this point, this run, Kangaskhan did come into this fight at level 8, and it made it through with a pretty solid time. 
Now I'm going to do something that wastes a little bit of time in the short term, but you have to stick with me and trust in the process. I'm going to go pick up an early pink bow. So on the positive side, we get to see that on Kangaskhan for the majority of the video, which is a plus. But this pickup will allow me to just hit harder and ultimately down the line, it's going to allow me not to have to train as much. Moving forward, there are two optional battles here I'm going to pick up on my way to Azalea. Fisher Ralph has a Goldeen that gives some pretty good experience in comparison to everything else. And then I'm going to use Mud Slap. Use it pretty much for one of the two times in the entire run on Hiker Russell. And after that, we can just clean up the Slowpoke well, and it's time for Bugsy. At this point, we do have Bite, and with Metapod and Kakuna's low special, you would think that that would be the way to go. But remember, we have 40 special attack. Even a two-hit Comet Punch, when they have hard enough, pretty much does more damage. Just to sort of like drive home the point of how worthless special moves are on this Pokemon. You basically here, you're just gonna hope that Kakuna doesn't poison you with Poison Sting, and the real battle begins on the Scyther. Here, it's gonna be a race between Fury Cutter ramping up and you not getting screwed over by Comet Punch being such. A bad move here. I get lucky here, it misses the first Fury Cutter, which is great, so I can set up one Leer. And at this point, you can easily win if you just don't miss Comet Punch. And it really it helps you out a lot if you get like a four hit. Now, here we see how much Comet Punch kind of falls short. It feels really bad. I don't want to keep saying that, but it does. I don't miss, but I only get a two hit into a three hit. And that means that even though I got pretty lucky and Scyther missed the first turn, I still get pretty low, but a win is a win. And if we're being positive, which I'm trying to do, only being level 15 here, it sets us up pretty well going forward. Rival number two is next, and just to show more spots of in the run to like make you realize how bad 40 special is, Bite cannot one-shot the Ghastly. Mud Slap can't either, so you're kind of just throwing caution to the wind, giving into the RNG, hoping nothing bad happens, but it doesn't. Now the rest of the battle, it's essentially over from there, but this is a milestone battle for Kangaskhan because guys, this is the last time that I ever have to use Comet Punch in the entire playthrough, and that's because an Ilex Forest headbutt is up for grabs, and to say that this is an upgrade would not do it justice. There are also two ether here's to pick up and I will be making full use of them during the course of this entire run but I want to talk about my strategy for the run in a little bit as we kind of trickle into the problematic areas but first let's talk about goldenrod errands. Here I would like to kind of muse about something that I noticed and it's that most runs I watch they go to the bottom part of the underground while I choose to go to the top and I guess I'll give my reasoning and say that I think that the bottom path is just a waste of time overall. Now in reality there's just a couple of slow pokes in the way you can be done but the scientist here he has three magnemites and he's a mandatory trainer he may not look like it right now because you can skip him but later when you have to go to the basement for the rocket takeover you will have to fight him my logic is that you go ahead and get this experience out of the way now when it's at least of some use to you rather than finding him way later when you're like level 30 if that makes sense now you turn something that's just a waste of time later into something that has actual value now and then later in the game when the takeover is going on, you can just get this out of the way. The trainers are already defeated. You can, you can just focus on being fast and efficient. So let's talk about this route. And the overall goal was to train as little as possible up to the third gym here. On Bugsy, you saw that I still had a pretty small margin for error. It was still pretty close. But I don't want to train any until the run gets to the point to where I have to. So in this little part, I'm going to do the bare minimum. And let me just say that it makes me sad that I can't talk to Juggler Irwin anymore. I guess I could. Now, I miss him and his level 2 Voltorb, but my inner speedrunner, it just, it likes faster times more than I like Juggler Erwin. Now, you might have also noticed Fury Cutter on the learn set, and we'll go over that, but it's the cheat code for the Whitney fight. When I teleport back after talking to the Squirt Bottle Lady, I'm, I'm going to skip the mark. I have to bring up the elemental punches right now, and I really want to express my disappointment that they didn't really do much for Kangaskhan in this run. I've talked about the 40 base special attack enough already. I've talked about it a lot, but what it equates to is that Fire Punch at this stage cannot one-shot a Magnemite, and virtually every situation, even like a resisted physical move, will just do more than any special move. I also can't get Return right now. Notice the little happy Huggy Heart guy says 135 on the overlay. You can't get Return until 150, so that's just another reason to avoid wasting time in the Mart right now, but it's time to go over Whitney real quick. 
I just mentioned that Fury code is that cheat code and you can do this spot several levels earlier than you should be able to with it and it all starts with that Clefairy. Now it's not really a threat but you're gonna see it kind of get lucky here and kind of kind of beat me down a little bit if I'm being honest with you but it's gonna take four Fury Cutters to take it out but notice on that overlay I have that Fury Cutter effect of power working. It's gonna double its power to a cap every time you use it but the time we're done with that I'm at a massive 180 base power going into the mill tank. Now this fight normally takes a level 20. Now here at 18, you're gonna be outsped and this it's really a nightmare. Now you can go try to go straight headbutt, but you're not gonna be able to outpace this pink little cow. And I did mess around with mud slap accuracy cheese, but let me say that Whitney's mill tank, it hits more through six stages of debuff accuracy more than anything I've ever seen in my entire life. It's really frustrating. Now the long and the short here is that Fury Cutter makes this fight really quick and it lets you do this battle multiple levels sooner and that's the ultimate goal. Whitney's Bash does give us that increased damage to normal type moves so it goes without saying that it's a pretty big deal but as is tradition let's take a look at some split data. Since Lugia is the current leader I see no reason to not compare the splits to that and here's what we're working with. The reality is that Kangaskhan has it, it's cut corners did the best that it can did what it needed to do to get to this point but it's already significantly behind the streamlined silver legendary. I'm personally I'm not ready to give up on Kangaskhan yet there's a lot of game left to play play but already being in the hole nine minutes and 36 seconds leaves a uphill battle to say the least now we can kind of move ahead and get to that part of the game where Kangaskhan has the most trouble in low special attack really limits your options rival number three Morty Chuck they are approaching fast and let's see how we kind of handle that today the strategy is going to be to pick up an early hidden power to problem solve the problematic top matchups because we got many of those coming up now if you look on the right hidden power I'm showing it here it's it's ground top and what this does is virtually eliminate the desperate need to rely on special attacks now this is a short-term solution it doesn't really take too much time and we can just dive straight into rival number three now this is gonna look really easy and it is but remember Kangaskhan has incredible stats it's a very capable Pokemon with the sole exception of going against maybe ghost types or steel types which are both front loaded in this fight and the gym's ghost type now hidden power ground in general it's great in Pokemon Crystal especially for physical Pokemon but for Kangaskhan it's the perfect solution to most of its problems at least for now so before we hop into that fourth gym, I have to highlight Sage Ping. He has about 47 Gastlys. You all know him, you all love him, I hate him. This is the first of two, only two parts in the entire game where a special move can actually one shot and is actually kind of useful in the run. Now, just for a fun game, see if you guys can go to the comments down below and guess where the other time is. If you get it right, I'll say good job, son, and you'll feel pretty good about it. So let's just move to Morty. To no one's surprise, it's the hidden power ground is going to be taken over here. With Kangaskhan's stats, I do outspeed Gengar and the entire team, so realistically it only has one shot to hit Hypnosis, so I didn't see the need to get the Mint Berry here just to save a little bit of time. Now this one's not bad, the routing adjustment to get hidden power ground really made this a breeze, but I will call attention to my learn set now, I have Mega Punch. It's a Gen 1 staple, you get it really early in Mount Moon, so it's pretty weird to finally see it in a Gen 2 run. but. It's really strong. 80 base power, you got Whitney's badge, you got the pink bow, you got stab. It's a beefy 148 effective power move. It's pretty solid if you can just kind of maybe find it in your heart to not focus on that 85% accuracy. But let's close this out. We do have some problems to look forward to. So for normal type Pokemon, you face some potential big problems around this time. The first is that fourth gym wall, just like we've already solved. And then you have your fighting weakness just kind of staring you in the face. You get a big spoonful of Chuck brother coming right up. Now for Kangaskhan, you get that pink bow early. You really trim down that early game. And then you're going to train at this point. And I feel like that yielded the best results for this specific run. And I will be picking up the a couple extra battles here, three total. The very efficient bird keeper Toby first and there's gonna be beauty Olivia now we're gonna go inside the lighthouse I'm gonna pick up sailor Ernest that's gonna be all the optional battles and that's gonna get us ready for the Chuckster and as we take that brisk swim down to Cyanwood let's talk about the difference in a run like this maybe compared to Granbull that was pretty recent as much DNA as these Pokemon share they're really similar one has a special attack problem one of them has a speed problem and my friends I gotta tell you that all problems are not created equal having a speed 
speed problem in Gen 2 is awful and the Gramble route needed much more help in this section and ultimately in my rule set where I banned the move curse, poor speed dramatically alters the end game. I guess a way to look at it is when you have low special attack it does feel bad at the start of the game but we've already solved the problem and it's pretty much done it's not gonna bother us anymore for the rest of the game whereas if you have a speed problem like Gramble that's gonna persist for the entire game all the way to the red font and that's the gigantic difference between those two runs but let's take a look at this run Kangaskhan fighting all these little fighting top trainers I'm gonna hit level 30 and I think you know what time it is Chuck, brother. With Primate level 30, the Pink Bow, Mega Punch has an incredibly high percent chance just to one tap it and be done. Now, if you didn't one shot this Pokemon and you tried to come here earlier, it can use even a Leer would make the Polyrath pretty much impossible, or this thing would just chip you down a little bit and make things that much harder. On Polyrath, I get some luck. I get the Flinch chance on Headbutt, which lets me get two free turns in a roll, and things are looking pretty great, but not so fast, my friend. I don't have the Mint Berry, so I'm susceptible to Hypnosis, and naturally, Naturally, I get put to sleep. I can survive one dynamic punch, so it's not over yet, but when the Polyrath decides just to crit, that does put a nail in the coffin. It gives us our first reset of the run. Going back in, things get pretty scary early when I miss the one shot. Now, I see a Fury Swipe miss here, so the crisis is averted. We can go back to that Polyrath. I hit hard. It takes aim to make dynamic punch a guaranteed hit, and after getting it down to just one more turn left, I take heavy damage. I get confused. It comes down to a 50-50 coin flip. Kangaskhan fights through the confusion, it delivers the final headbutt, and we get past this huge hurdle. Just to cover my bases here, I went headbutt on Polyrath because both it and Mega Punch are three hits. Obviously I'm going to choose headbutt because it has a flinch chance and 15% more accuracy. But one reset to get through this fight without really catering to it too much in this run was a pretty big win in my book, but it does get us access to fly so I'm going to be backtracking, picking up some candies, other goodies. And after meeting Lance at the Lake of Rage, I think you know what time it is. It's that time in the video where Lance uses Hyper Beam on other humans, but I'm not going to turn a blind eye today. We're actually going to talk about the rocket sections in the game. I got some comments, several comments, and I have to cash in some receipts and give you guys some information and data here right now. So in Gen 1, I talk about Nugget Bridge being the single highest cluster of mandatory battles in the entire game. You guys know that. Now sometimes during my crystal runs, people will say something to this effect. They'll say, hey, the two games are about the same in terms of the rocket sections they take a similar amount of time and I cannot let something so wrong stand without saying something now here's some numbers I'm gonna stick to just Pokemon red Pokemon yellow has one less overall battle during these sessions so keep that in mind with what I'm about to say in the rocket hideout gen 1 there's only five mandatory battles when you get to Silphco there's only four that's a total of nine battles that's not a lot but what about gen 2 now I always talk about how these are slogs and we skip over them because generally it's really boring there's low level Pokemon it's just not fun to watch but there is a much bigger problem here that we never talk about now if you had to guess if I said hey how many mandatory battles do you think are in the hideout and takeover section in gen 2 would you say 15 20 25 mandatory battles now keep in mind I got really good at skipping spinners and ultimately I modded them out of the game to eliminate the RNG so that can cut out one battle but sit down because I don't know if you guys are ready for these numbers there are 11 mandatory battles inside of the rocket hideout I think most people would do 12 because there's a probably the most difficult spinner in the game here and then when we skip ahead to the rocket takeover section it's it's really bad there's 22 battles spanning the three-part takeover section giving us a grand total of 33 mandatory battles if you're skipping spinners 33 that's a lot that's not far away from being half of the mandatory battles in the entire game of gen 1 and it's kind of sad. So when you compare the two, it's ultimately 9 versus 33. Just a few more battles in Gen 2 and you would have four times as many battles as the Gen 1 rocket section. And I don't mean to drop this huge information dump on you and go on a tangent, but this got me thinking, how much better would the pacing of Gen 2 be if you could cut out maybe like 20 of these battles, maybe up the levels to kind of even out the experience? And looking at the split data a lot from Gen 2 runs lately, my data tells me that Gen 2 
would be very similar to Gen 1 and Link if you cut down these a lot, if you just took them out of the game. And I don't think anyone would complain, but this is something I had to bring up. But remember, I did spend some time talking about this, but if I showed the rocket sections, it would be 10 times longer than this, but let's move on. We gotta get on with the run one day. Let's clean up a couple of gems real quick. Price is up first. Now this one's straightforward. It's price, what do you expect? But I do take two blizzards at the end and I get quite low. Now, just some anecdotal, just looking at the footage, I guarantee if we had the Gen 1 special rather than that boosted special defense in Gen 2, Kangaskhan would probably have lost here. I can't prove it, but it's just a, a gut feeling, I guess. Next up is Jasmine, and fun fact, Fire Punch would actually do more damage to Steelix than Hidden Power Ground uh, due to this big beefer defense stat this thing has. And I actually reset here due to an Iron Tail defense drop. And since I did bring up Fire Punch, uh, the difference is pretty negligible, so it's not worth routing in an extra Mark Visit for. Now you're gonna see that even on a pretty solid attempt, that it's just really hard to get through this thing at level 35, and I was really close to just routing in extra levels, maybe picking up Soft Sand, maybe going for that fire punch, maybe using rare candies. But at the end of the day, I decided just to keep it as it is. It's not a great fight, but just like Chuck, I did save a lot of time. Just in the trade off here was that I had a tougher fight and I'm all right with that at the end of the day, but that's seven badges down. And I think you guys know what time it is. Now we get that dreaded phone call. It reminds us that only guys, me and you, we're the only people that can stop the rocket takeover and forgive me, but I've already, I've kind of spent a lot of time already talking about this. Lots of battles, 22 mandatory battles in this section nobody wants to see them i don't even want to see them and I'm, I'm playing the game so let's skip over it after that it is important first up is vitamins and kangaskhan has good enough speed to not even worry about it so i fill in the gaps here with protein and hp ups which you rarely see me buy and for as much as i have kind of dogged this really bad special attack i am finally going to pick up a punch for utility and this right here is going to mark a big pivot in our learn set and what we're going to leave here with is return finally we already had a hidden power ground i'm going to learn shadow ball and then we're going to use fire punch and let's just go right into that final gym him. Even though I picked up a special move, don't get it twisted. 40 specials, awful. Even if you had Ice Punch and never melt ice here, it would still do less damage than Return. And speaking of Return, if this is your first Gen 2 video, it's about the takeover. Something like Kingdra can survive, and what I've noticed in pretty much every run I did, it would always get a Hyper Potion just to waste a little more time. But Kangaskhan, it has its problems in the rear view mirror, and it finishes off the badge portion of Johto in a dominant state. Before the league, there's a couple of extra stops here. I need the optional candies from both the World Islands and from Mount Mortar. And there's gonna be just one optional battle that I'm gonna be picking up. Cool Trainer Gavin gives just enough experience to get me to where I need to be. And we don't have to look at the final rival, but I would like to just quickly look at split data just to catch us up a little bit. Now here, we're gonna see that Lugia, it's just, it's dominant. Kangaskhan kept slipping after that Whitney split, got all the way down to a 15 minute deficit at Chuck. But to this mommy's credit, it did chip it back down to nine minutes around Claire. But I think at this point, it's pretty clear that Kangaskhan just doesn't have the chops to be the top dog in Gen 2, but that doesn't mean we can't finish strong. Now before going into Will, I'm gonna use candies. I'm gonna use a few to get up to level 53, and this all but eliminates any worry with Bruno, and it's gonna just speed up the process overall. But without further ado, let's just see how the Elite Four shakes up. As you guys know, I don't see the need for false excitement. I don't want to build up a battle that is just so straightforward, so we don't need to waste a ton of time on the Elite Four as a whole. Return and Shadow Ball are really close here in effective power, and Shadow Ball's real use here on the learn set now is to kind of lessen the load on Return, at least for now. The Slowbro is the singular Pokemon on the team that can survive a hit, so this one is mostly one-shots, and Kangaskhan just makes Wheel's life really hard today with a clean victory. Koga is more of the same, but if you can believe it, he's actually easier than Wheel. He does not have a Slowbro on the team that can survive a hit, and earlier, if you guessed the Pokemon that's gonna die to a special attack, if you said it was Fortress, then congratulations, you did it. And I'm also, I don't think I mentioned Earthquake, it's on the learn set now, but it was just a strict upgrade to Hidden 
power, and everything I just said boils down to one thing. I can one-shot every single Pokemon on Koga's team, we can move on to Bruno. Bruno can sometimes be Chuck 2.0 and can be kind of problematic, but Kangaskhan just hits really hard. Now at this point, Return is pretty much just a tactical nuke, and the fighting top weakness is just a thing of the past. He can't even retaliate. Now being level 53, it led to me being level 55 here, and that's what you need to avoid pretty much any chance of a Machamp cross chop crit ruining your day. And I guess I'll talk about Onyx for no reason, but Ice Punch could one shot it, but the side effect of an unexpected side effect of getting the Machamp into a one shot range, it just made Earthquake a one hit here too. But this was pretty much the hardest remaining challenge in the game outside of Red, so good job, Bruno. Karen is up next, and there's one question on my mind Will Kangaskhan join the Umbreon one shot club? And the answer is no. And just to crush my hopes and dreams further, I get Sand Attack, but remember Gen 2 only drops accuracy to 75% as opposed to that nasty Gen 1 66%, so I'm not overly worried. I get some pretty great ranges, I connect with most of my moves, and things are looking good until I miss on the Houndoom, and this is yet another instance where if Kangaskhan's special defense was like it was in Gen 1, I think this would be a reset because I get crit, I go down to red health, but I do hang on, finish up, and now we're looking straight ahead at the champion. There's one key change to take note of here, and it's that gold chain with that paralyzed cure berry on it, and this is mandatory for this fight. Removing the pink bow loses our guaranteed one shot on Gyarados, but it's kind of like a no harm, no foul type situation. And let's talk about, I guess, the lose conditions for this battle. This berry will cure one instance of paralysis, but there's back to back dirty Thunder Wave users waiting to use it, so a miss would be ideal. But keep in mind that this is not an instant loss if you get paralyzed. I do get the 25% chance here on the second paralysis, but to be blunt, the battle's pretty much over if you get that. This battle can be much tighter being paralyzed, and if you start to miss turns, it just keeps getting harder. Now the true lose condition here, to where there's almost no coming back from it, is if Charizard gets a burn, maybe he gets a crit, but those are pretty low odds of happening. And while I would love to show you guys footage of me kind of struggling, being paralyzed, getting through the fight, missing four turns in a row, or maybe a burn making me do pathetic damage, all you're gonna get today is a clean fight and Kangaskhan is gonna be taking the crown. And speaking of crown, I had this working on my stream, but yeah, I finally got it working. Uh, it wasn't working with Politoed, it really messed up. So for the first time, everyone, you can congratulate Kangaskhan. It's Johto's new champion, but there's a whole other side of the world to get through, so let's fade to black and just kind of get to it. In the Lugia video, I detailed the Kanto route a little bit more than I usually do, and I don't see the need to really repeat myself, but something I will clarify is that following a certain path doesn't necessarily mean you have to beat the gym leaders. Now, for example, if Surge is a tough battle, maybe you're outsped for, for whatever reason, just having the flight path to Vermilion is enough just to backtrack and not really lose that much time. The main goal is to be efficient at unlocking the flight path so you can get easy access to the gyms rather than beating the gyms themselves. For my money, I do think Sabrina's pretty mandatory because it's like you're on the straight line path that's a little bit out of the way and if you can just get it done it just saves a little bit of time. But you can kind of mix and match the other ones and be fine if your overworld planning is pretty solid. Now the main thing you want to do if you can plan it out is to only heal one time in the entire Kanto section. And doing it at this center on Route 10 above the power plant is the best place since you can't actually fly here. This will make the machine part quest a lot better because this part and the lengthy nugget bridge section is really where Kanto starts to gobble up a lot of time. I know this isn't super in depth but I do highly suggest maybe checking out the last live stream I did on Crystal or like the post elite or part of the Lugia video if you want to know more but Kangaskhan just dominates this part of the game. Now even when we take a peek in on a fight like blue there's really nothing to see. The only thing that was even a slight inconvenience is being kind of trolled by Gyarados constantly getting full restores. It felt Felt like Blue had like a bag bursting at the seams with full restores. He was desperately wanting to keep his water snake alive, but I think this was a pretty clean Kanto section.
population overall. As for split data, there's not really any need to do any significant analysis. Now at this point, it is a pretty decently close race for second, but Lugia with a nine minute lead at this point, it's not gonna be caught. If anything, I think it kind of shows Lugia's dominance, but just because a run doesn't set like a world record or doesn't grab the top spot, it doesn't mean that it's a failed run, but we do still have some work to do, my friends. Preparation for red is pretty simple. I have five candies, I'll hit level 70, I'll be using leftovers, and you're already seeing it in the footage here, but we have another first for crystal. Dynamic punch will be on the learn set. I repeat, there will be a dynamic punch sighting in this video, and now let's just take a look and see how it goes. Pikachu doesn't really need any screen time this week. Unlike Gramble, this thing is not an absolute nightmare. We can just one-shot it and never talk about it again. On Espeon, we have a little over 30% chance to one-shot it with a Shadow Ball. And unfortunately, I do not get it here. And we see the worst case scenario, and that's it setting up Reflect. This really throws a wrench in your plans, but like always, let's just play it out and see how it goes. Snorlax by itself is a menace, and it's the worst Pokemon in the entire game. Now, when you miss your first turn Dynamic Punch, it makes it even worse. And when you get paralyzed on the very first body slam, you pretty much reach rock bottom. Now, interestingly enough, I do hit Dynamic Punch and Snorlax starts to hit itself multiple times. Reflect wears off. And I actually get past it. So you might be sitting here thinking, hey, there's actually a chance, but I think Venusaur just has too much of a lead at this point. Uh, paralysis, missing turns combined with Sunny Day giving this fat frog powered up synthesis to heal and instant cast solar beams. It's just too much. And that's going to be the third reset of the run. On the next attempt, I get the one shot with Shadow Ball, which is really good. But Dynamic Punch, it'll be Dynamic Punch. It's going to miss. But what's more frustrating is another back-to-back -back instant paralysis on the first body slam. Now, admittedly, having that happen is going to be like a 100% loss, but I do quit out. I don't even give Red the satisfaction of knocking out my Pokemon, but that's going to be reset number four. I just, I hate it when you see the computer hit low odds, like back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. I just, I really don't like it. On the third attempt, it starts out great. Once again, we get the one shot on Espeon, but like we've already seen, this fight is far from over. Finally, I do get a coin flip to go my way. I'm the one hitting Dynamic Punch now. It's my time. And since Snorlax just goes for Amnesia, it is in range of Return. Now, if you're wondering, there's like a 75% chance that Return will fail the two hit on Snorlax. So that's where Dynamic Punch comes in today. But not being paralyzed here makes Venusaur an easy two hit, but it does set up Sunny Day before it goes down. Down. This does make the Charizard hit really hard, but unlike some Pokemon, I'm not going to name any names, Kangaskhan has actual speed, and even though this flamethrower does hurt, I have more than enough health to finish the job. Blastoise is all that's left. I got the two-shot range, and Rain Dance, it's just not going to cut it today, brother. And that means that this run is over. Kangaskhan finishes with a final time of 3 hours, 42 minutes, and 57 seconds, which isn't bad. I still don't have a tier list ready for you guys, but I think this would be third place behind Lugia and Scizor. But I can't really say that this one felt good. Now, while the final time does look decent, it just felt like there were so many labored steps and so much extra trying that just kind of held it back a little bit. Now, like I said at the start, if this thing started out with like Stomp or maybe even Mega Punch, it might be something pretty special. But speaking of special, that low special attack just holds it back just enough to keep it out of that upper echelon of Gen 2 runs. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support means a lot. And if you made it this far, you're a real one. I appreciate it. Subscribe if you haven't. Check out another run on the channel if you haven't seen all those. And I'm going to get started on doing like a different kind of run for April Fools, I guess. Even though I'm going to be doing it like a day early, but you get what I'm saying. That's about all I have for you and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.